So this is a biscuit jointer. It's not necessarily something that you, you're going to buy first. There are other tools that perhaps you get more use out of, but it does play a big role in modern furniture making, especially when we're doing panel work. It creates a very strong joint and uh, it does it very quickly and, and very easily. So it's, uh, it's a sort of cost-effective method of putting timber together. And if we look at our... Just looking up at this board, we've got a few applications, a few places where you could use biscuit joints. Here we've got edges of boards being put together. There we've got joining a shelf into the side of a, a, a shelf. So we've got T-shaped joints. We've got basically what amounts to a mortise and tenon joint, a framing joint, fitting frames to the fronts of panelled cupboards, even mitre joints and long mitres, all done with biscuit joints. So there's lots and lots of ways to use this. We're going to start with something very basic, what it was probably invented for in the first place, and we're going to join two, two boards together, edge to edge. Now, just a little bit of explanation before I do that. What we're going to do for the, the rest of this and the, the sort of subsequent tutorial videos, we're going to try and do a little project. We're going to be making this, which I know looks like a sofa, but it's actually a little bookshelf. And we've put it together to try and demonstrate some of the key techniques that you're going to be using with your basic power tools, pre predominantly the router, which is probably the most important part of your workshop. We'll get onto that in a bit. The reason I'm going to join these two boards together, which are going to form the back of our sofa come bookshelf, is if I use pine as thin as this and as wide as this in one plank, it will probably bow, it will cup, unless we've got really, really good quality wood that's been perfectly dried for the environment that it's going to go into, it's going to end up with a, a bow on it. So, one way to avoid that is to saw our plank in half, which we've done here, and have a look at the grain on the end. If you look very, very carefully, you'll see a pattern to the grain, and if you alternate that pattern, so this grain is running this way, and this grain is running this way, the, the relative movement will be less, and it will tend to counteract. One, um, one bow will tend to counteract the other. So if you were making a big tabletop, you'd probably have several planks, and you'd have one one way, one the other, one, one way, one the other so the, the cumulative effect of that bow isn't making your tabletop do this, it's just making it do this just a little bit and we can live with that. So that's what we're going to do and I've checked my grain, I've got the side that I like best which is this side, so I'm going to put my face side like that and I'm going to put three little index marks, one, two, three, didn't measure them, I've just set them a certain amount in from the edge one in the middle and again a certain amount in from the edge and it doesn't have to be any more accurate than that nobody is going to see your biscuit joints um, all they'll see is these boards that are, are glued together but they do need to the two the two indents that we're going to make need to line up and that'll become a little bit more obvious as we uh, as we go through the tutorial and you see how we use the biscuit jointer so we'll set that up next put our bits of wood to one side this is a 240 volt biscuit jointer which is okay in a workshop it's not okay on a building site anywhere outdoors that would need to be 110 volt um, but with this this is fine in here because it's nice and dry and a relatively safe environment but what I am going to do I'm going to use an extension cord with a circuit breaker built in so plug that in leaving it switched off for now while I do the setup, and I can see my plug, I can see that I'm not, I'm not plugged in. But once I've got everything set up, I'm going to make sure that that stop button, which is just a push stop, is nice and close so I can step on it if anything goes wrong. Um, so, next thing that I need to do is I've got a, a guide fence with a, a gear here. That slides down into here, slides down into this slot here, so that will move up and down. And when I'm actually operating, 
the biscuit jointer, notice it's switched off so there's no, no risk in what I'm doing here. As that pushes through, this blade will protrude and it'll put a very fine slot into the pieces of wood that we're trying to join together. And I want that slot to be pretty much in the middle of my piece of wood. So I'll line that up, line up my blade and adjust this guide fence so that as I'm making my cut, it's pretty much in the middle of the timber. Now it doesn't matter, I'm just going to lock, lock that off, make sure it's nice and parallel. Just check that everything's running parallel because there's a little bit of slop in this and then lock with the locking nut here. Okay, the reason it doesn't really matter is that this guide plate is your index. That sets the depth whichever of these that I'm cutting. As long as I work from the top of this one and the top of that one, everything should pretty much line up. And if I get the centre of my cutter, which I can see through this slot here, lined up with my pencil marks, then everything's going to line up, everything's going to be in the right place. So before we use the biscuit jointer, just a little quick word on PPE. Obviously I've got my boots on, I'm going to be wearing eye protection, ear defenders, and because it's quite dusty and difficult to attach dust extraction to with being such a small tool, um, I'm going to use a dust mask. So pop that on first. Eye protection, ear defenders, all ready to go before I plug in. Switch on at the plug and I'm ready to go. So lining up with my slot, So we wait till the machine stopped before we put it down. Switch off, plug out, and let's have a look at what we've got. So we've got three slots that these biscuits will drop into. And when we put the other slots into this piece, it'll all go together and you get a very, very tight fit. We use PVA glue just a little bit of glue and as these biscuits get moist not only do you get the mechanical strength from the glue and the fact that they're dropping into this slot they expand slightly so they really grip your piece of work together and it's very very strong it's a very very strong joint in all sorts of applications so we've got all our slots cut and we're ready to put everything together so PVA glue Just a small smear on the meeting faces. Not too much. We don't want a lot of squeeze out and we don't want a strong glue line. And then we drop a little bit of glue into, into the slots. And we drop some glue in the mating piece. Glue into the slots where the biscuits will go. But none on the mating faces. We don't need to overdo the glue. And then just Tap these biscuits, you can see why they're called biscuits, they look almost like a biscuit that you'd have in your coffee. Just tap them into place. I'm going to put our two bits of wood together. Not like that, remember we've got our face side that we want to match and we've got our little index points as well. So just pretty much line those up. Just get a little bit of pressure on. Make sure that's nice and even. And we're going to drop it into our clamps. A little bit of scrap wood either side to protect the timber and bring the clamps home. Pretty close to the edge of the timber, maybe just 10, 10 or 15 millimetres in from the end, ends of the timber. So I've got two clamps here. I want a balancing clamp. 
because they have a tendency to put a bit of a bow onto the timber that we're using so we put a, another clamp pretty much dead centre but working from the top rather than the bottom and if we're doing something really big you might have several clamps and remember to alternate top bottom top bottom so they balance one another so I'm just I've just nipped those up not too tight bit of scrap timber make sure everything's nice and flat to the clamps that means that everything's flat and parallel and then just another quarter of a turn don't need too much don't want to overdo it and you don't want a lot of glue squeezing out just enough to show you that all your meeting surfaces have got an even and thin film of glue so that's ready to go off this will take it says five minutes i'd leave it for half an hour another really useful tool uh, for the the home woodworker or the small crafts crafts person trying to set up a, the, their own business is a jigsaw electric jigsaw it's worth buying a good one, a good quality, a well-known brand. Uh, the, type of, the kind of cut that you get with the very cheap jigsaws and power tools that you can get. Um, the, the sort of generic products that you can buy from a DIY outlet. Tends to be quite poor, quite frustrating. There are some tools that you can get away with that with, but a jigsaw, it's worth buying the best that you can afford. So what's it for? A jigsaw cuts freehand curves, for the most part, in thin sheet material. With the right blades you can cut perspex, you can cut uh, various man-made boards or, or thin timber. Um, you need to choose the right blade for the sort of work that you want to do. You can cut metal with it, you can get a, a hacksaw type blade that fits in your jigsaw for cutting thin sheet aluminium or thin sheet steel. Very noisy and quite slow but it will do it. Um, what we've got in here is a pretty standard blade designed to fit this jigsaw there are various types you need to make sure that the blade you're buying is compatible with your jigsaw so it's good to ask and it's designed for fairly quick cutting in wood if I needed to change this this blade and put something in for finer cuts or for cutting metal or perspex something like that in this jigsaw we have a little grub screw it's an allen key it's an allen screw needing an allen key so we just undo that, take the blade out and replace it. A lot of jigsaws these days have a bayonet fitting where the blade goes in and you twist it. Um, the instructions for fitting the blade will come with the tool as you buy it. It's always good to ask uh, in the shop when you buy the, the tool as well just to, to make sure that you know how to change the blade. Some can be quite confusing. This lever on the side confuses some people. What it does, it puts a a sawing action forward and backwards into the cut that this blade's making. Normally it's going straight up and down. This is set on zero, so that blade will just go straight up and down. If you want to cut very, very quickly through timber, you can adjust the sawing action, the forwards and backwards action. So if I put that on number three, that's moving quite, quite vigorously forwards and backwards as it goes up and down. So you can imagine that's taking quite a lot of timber out of the way. However, that reduces the accuracy that you can work with. So if you're doing fine cuts, it's better to leave it on zero. To be honest, for most of the use that I get out of a jigsaw, I'll leave that on zero. So you've got speed adjustment. This one will go from six right down to, to one. If you find that you're burning your timber, or if you're cutting plastic, you can reduce, reduce the speed. Um, if you want to go quite quickly through your timber, you can increase the speed, and again, to be honest, for most uses, you just put it on full speed and that should work for you. But experiment, have a play around and see what works for you. So it's a very safe tool. Eye protection does kick up quite a lot of dust. Um, ear defenders, because it is quite noisy. And if you're cutting MDF or hardwoods for definite, you'd want to wear a dust mask or organise some local exhaust ventilation, i.e. you plug it into your hoover. For the little shortcut that we're doing in softwood, we're okay with our ear defenders and eye protection. So I've marked up a curve, which is going to be this, on the back of our bookshelves, bookcase. And it's, it's all ready to go. What you'll notice is that I'm cutting quite a little bit away from the line. When we're cutting in the workshops and we're doing mortise and tenon joints 
and dovetail joints, you've been trying to cut right through the line, bisecting that line, leaving a little bit on the, the wood that you're keeping and, and taking the rest of the waste wood away. When we're cutting with a jigsaw, we can't cut to that sort of accuracy. It's not designed that way. So we cut maybe a couple of millimetres away from the line and then we need to finish that curve with something else. And I'll show you how to do that in a minute. Okay, so you can see that with our jigsaw, we've got quite a rough line. That certainly wouldn't be good enough for finished, high quality woodwork. So we have to take our, our uh, workpiece down to that line, and we're going to do it with a spoke shave. There's a number of ways that we could do it, but a really good uh, hand tool for finishing off any sort of curved work is uh, a, a, a spoke shave. It looks like this. We're going to look at how to sharpen them, and I'll show you how to set them. But um, for the purposes of this, we're going to imagine that you've got it set for a very fine cut. And there are different sorts of spoke shaves. This one has a flat bed. Um, we have ones with very curved beds, plates that uh, cut very tight inside curves, concave curves. This has got a flat bed for convex curves. We use it like this. Your fingers nestle nicely into the handles. Your thumbs go on these little indents here. Your forefingers are controlling the cut, pushing down or letting the pressure off a little bit on the front of the casting here. Okay, so I usually work at a slight angle this way, not straight on. It does a slicing cut, makes the, um, makes the cut a little bit sweeter. And you feel where you're going. I'm leaning my head over a little bit so I can see as I work down to the line, I can see there's quite a lot of work to, to do on that corner there, so I'm just going to try and get that down to the line, pretty much. And by doing that slight angle, I'm stopping that tearing right on the edge there. And it gives a little bit of support as well, so as that cut goes off, it doesn't just drop off the edge. So that's pretty much down to the line. Now I'll start to take my cut back. I've got a nice sweet rolling motion as I take that down to the pencil line. And you'll notice that I'm only going that way. I'm not going here. You can see the grain like this by cutting across the grain this way or along the grain this way. I'm not raising the ends of the grain. If I was cutting this way, imagine my fingers is the grain. As I was cutting, that would be splintering and lifting the grain. So we always try and push the grain back into the timber, which we're doing with that sort of cut wouldn't be here. So to do this side, we turn around and work that way. So I'm nearly down to my pencil line now. Just before I do that final shaving to take it down to the pencil line, I want to make sure it's a nice sweet curve. Don't want any humps or hollows. A sign of good quality curved work is that those curves are nice and sweet and you know it when you see it. It's difficult to describe but you know when you see it. So I'm going to shut one eye and I'm going to look down that curve and look for any humps and hollows. I'm almost ignoring my pencil line now because my pencil is probably less likely to produce a really sweet curve than my spoke shave. If that's nice and sharp and you've got that rolling motion, that's going to put a really nice sweet curve. And I can so there's, see there's no humps on there, no hollows. So I'm going to get my square. Check that it's square all the way along. A little bit more to come off this front edge. Take that down to the pencil line with a really fine cut. I'm going to turn around and do the other, the other side and that should be done, that should be really nice. 